Trauma is the leading cause of death worldwide. Approximately two-thirds of patients have a chest trauma. Blunt chest trauma is the most common with 90% incidence, of which less than 10% require surgical intervention of any kind. Mortality is second highest after head injury, which underlines the importance of initial management. Many of these deaths can be prevented by prompt diagnosis and treatment. Blunt trauma occurs when the chest strikes or is struck by an object. The impact can cause shearing and compress the thoracic structures. The external injury may appear minor, but internally the organs may have severe injuries. Rib and sternal fractures can lacerate lung tissue. In high velocity impact, shearing forces can result in lacerations or tearing of the aorta. Compression of the chest may result in contusion, crush injury, and organ rupture. Penetrating trauma is an injury in which a foreign object impales or passes through the body tissues, creating an open wound. Examples include knife wounds, gunshot wounds, and injuries with other sharp objects. Emergency care of the patient with a chest injury is presented in your book in Table 2719. The most common thoracic injuries and their management are described in Table 2720. A pneumothorax is caused by air entering the pleural cavity. Normally, negative pressure exists between the visceral pleura, which is surrounding the lung, and the parietal pleura, lining the thoracic cavity, allowing the lung to be filled by chest wall expansion. This space contains only a few millimeters of lubricating fluid to reduce friction when the tissues move. When air enters this space, the change to positive pressure causes a partial or complete lung collapse. As the volume of the air in the pleural space increases, the lung volume decreases. This condition should be suspected after any trauma to the chest wall. It can be classified as open or closed. In an open pneumothorax, air enters through an opening in the chest wall and the parietal or the outer lining of the pleura. A closed pneumothorax occurs when the visceral lining, which is the inner lining of the pleura, is disrupted, allowing the air to enter into the pleural space from the lung. In this case, there is no external wound. If a pneumothorax is small, mild tachycardia and dyspnea may be the only manifestations. If the pneumothorax occupies a large area, respiratory distress may be present, including shallow rapid respiration, dyspnea, air hunger, and oxygen desaturation. Chest pain and a cough with or without hemoptysis may be present. On auscultation, there'll be no breath sounds over the affected area. A chest x-ray shows the presence of air or fluid in the pleural space and a reduction of the lung volume. A spontaneous pneumothorax usually occurs from the rupture of small blebs or air-filled sacs located on the surface of the lung. These blebs occur in healthy young individuals or as a result of lung disease such as COPD, asthma, cystic fibrosis, or pneumonia. Smoking increases the risk for bleb formation. Other risk factors include being tall and thin, male, a family history, or previous spontaneous pneumothoraxes. Iatrogenic pneumothorax can occur due to a laceration or puncture of the lung during a medical procedure. For example, transthoracic needle aspiration, subclavian catheter insertion, pleural biopsy, and transbronchial lung biopsy all have the potential to injure the lung. Barotrauma from excessive ventilator pressure during manual or mechanical ventilation can rupture alveoli or bronchioles. Esophageal procedures may also be involved in the development of a pneumothorax. Tearing during insertion of a gastric tube can allow air from the esophagus to enter the mediastinum in the pleural space. Traumatic pneumothorax can occur from either penetrating, which is open, or non-penetrating closed chest trauma. Penetrating trauma allows air to enter the pleural space through an opening in the chest wall. Examples include stab or gunshot wounds and surgical thoracotomies. A penetrating chest wound may be referred to as a sucking chest wound as air will enter the pleural space through the chest wall during inspiration. Emergency treatment consists of covering the wound with an occlusive dressing that is secured on three sides. This is called a vent dressing. During inspiration, as negative pressure is created in the chest, the dressing pulls against the wound preventing air from entering the pleural space. During expiration, as the pressure rises in the pleural space, the dressing is pushed out and the air escapes through the wound and from under the dressing. If the object that caused the open wound is still in place, don't remove it until a physician is present. Stabilize the impaled object with a bulky dressing. Non-penetrating chest trauma or blunt trauma, such as rib fractures, can lacerate the lung and cause air to enter the pleural space. Blunt trauma can also cause alveolar rupture secondary to sudden chest compression. 
Tension pneumothorax occurs when air enters the pleural space but cannot escape. The continued accumulation of air in the pleural space causes increasingly elevated interpleural pressure. This results in the compression of the lung on the affected side and pressures on the heart and great vessels, pushing them away from the affected side. The mediastinum shifts toward the unaffected side, compressing the good lung, which further compromises oxygenation. As the pressure increases, venous return is decreased and cardiac output fails. Tension pneumothorax is a medical emergency with both the respiratory and the cardiovascular systems affected. Manifestations include dyspnea, marked tachycardia, tracheal deviation, decreased or absent breast signs on the affected side, neck vein distension, cyanosis, and profuse diaphoresis. If the tension in the pleural space is not relieved, the patient is likely to die from inadequate cardiac output or severe hypoxemia. Treat with needle decompression and chest tube insertion. Hemothorax is an accumulation of blood in the pleural space resulting from injury to the chest wall, diaphragm, lung, blood vessels, or mediastinum. The patient with a traumatic hemothorax requires immediate insertion of a chest tube for evacuation of the blood, which can be recovered and reinfused for a short period of time after the injury. When it occurs with a pneumothorax, it's called a hemoneumothorax. Chylothorax is the presence of lymphatic fluid in the pleural space. The thoracic duct is disrupted either traumatically or from a malignancy, and the lymphatic fluid fills the pleural space. This milky white fluid is high in lipids. Normal lymphatic flow through the thoracic duct is about 1,500 to 2,500 mils per day. This amount can increase up to tenfold after ingestion of fats. 50% of cases will heal with conservative treatments such as chest drainage, bowel rest, and parenteral nutrition. Octreotide has been used to reduce the flow of lymphatic fluid with some success. Surgery and pleurodesis are options if conservative therapy fails. Pleurodesis is the artificial production of adhesions between the parietal and visceral pleura, usually done with a chemical sclerosing agent such as talc or doxycycline. Treatment for a pneumothorax depends on its severity and the nature of the underlying disease. If the patient is stable and the amount of air and fluid accumulated in the interpleural space is minimal, no treatment may be necessary as the condition may resolve spontaneously. The pleural space can also be aspirated with a large bore needle. This procedure is known as a thoracentesis. The most defining and common form of treatment of a pneumothorax and a hemothorax is the insertion of a chest tube and connecting it to water seal drainage. Repeated spontaneous pneumothorax may need to be treated surgically by a partial pleurectomy, stapling, or pleurodesis to promote adherence of the pleura to one another. Tension pneumothorax is a medical emergency requiring urgent needle decompression followed by chest tube insertion to water seal drainage. Rib fractures are the most common type of chest injury resulting from blunt trauma. Ribs 5 through 9 are the most commonly fractured because they are the least protected by the chest muscle. If the fractured rib is splintered or displaced, it may damage the pleura and the lungs. Clinical manifestations of fractured ribs include pain on the site of the injury, especially during inspiration and coughing. The patient splints the affected area and takes shallow breaths to try to decrease the pain. Atelactasis and pneumonia may develop because of the decreased ventilation and retained secretion. The goal of treatment is to decrease pain so that the patient can breathe adequately and clear secretions. Strapping the chest with tape or using a thoracic binder is not recommended since it limits chest expansion and predisposes the individual to atelactasis. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, opioids, and thoracic nerve blocks can be used to reduce pain and aid with deep breathing and coughing. Patient teaching should emphasize deep breathing, coughing, incentive spirometry, and the appropriate use of pain medications. This is a picture of a flailed chest. Flailed chest results from the fracture of several consecutive ribs in two or more separate places, causing an unstable segment. It can also be caused by fracture of the sternum and several consecutive ribs. The resulting instability of the chest wall causes paradoxical movement during breathing. The affected or flailed area will move in the opposite direction with respect to the intact portion of the chest. During inspiration, the affected portion is sucked in, and during expiration, it bulges out. This paradoxic chest movement prevents adequate ventilation of the lung in the injured area and increases the work of breathing. The underlying lung may have a pulmonary contusion aggravating hypoxemia. In an unconscious patient, a flailed chest is usually apparent on visual examination. The patient manifests rapid, shallow respirations and tachycardia. 
In a conscious patient, a flailed chest may not be initially apparent as a result of splinting of the chest wall. The patient moves air poorly and the movement of the thorax is asymmetric and uncoordinated. Palpation of abnormal respiratory movements, evaluation of crepitus near the rib fractures, chest x-ray and ABGs all assist in the diagnosis. Initial therapy consists of airway management, adequate ventilation, supplemental oxygen therapy, careful administration of IV fluids, and pain control. The definitive therapy is to re-expand the lung and ensure adequate oxygenation. Although many patients can manage without the use of mechanical ventilation, intubation and ventilation may be necessary. Surgical fixation of the flailed segment may be used. The lung parenchyma and fractured ribs will heal with time. Some patients continue to experience intercostal pain after the flailed chest has resolved. Cardiac tamponade is when blood rapidly collects in the pericardial sac, compressing myocardium because the pericardium does not stretch and prevents the ventricles from filling. Muffled distant heart sounds, hypotension, neck vein distension, and increased central venous pressure occur. It is a medical emergency. A pericardiocentesis with surgical repair is the appropriate intervention. Appropriate treatment for chest trauma is based on presentation. We begin with assessment. Signs of respiratory compromise include dyspnea, respiratory distress, cough with or without hemoptysis, cyanosis of the mouth, face, nail beds, and mucous membranes, tracheal deviation, audible air escaping from the chest wound, decreased breath sounds at the site or site of injury, decreased O2 saturation, and white or pink tinged frothy secretions. Chest trauma can also be reflected in cardiac compromise. Signs of imperiled cardiovascular functioning include rapid thready pulse, decreased blood pressure, narrowed pulse pressure, asymmetrical blood pressure values in the arms, distended neck veins, muffled heart sounds, chest pain, and dysrhythmias. Initial interventions for any patient with chest trauma include ensure that the patient has a patent airway. Administer oxygen to keep the O2 sat greater than 90%. Establish IV access with two large bore catheters and begin fluid resuscitation as appropriate. Remove clothing to assess injury. Cover sucking chest wounds with non-porous dressing taped on three sides. Additional interventions that may be completed initially for patients with chest trauma include Stabilization of impaled objects with a bulky dressing. Remember, don't remove the object. Assess for other significant injuries and treat appropriately. Stabilize flailed rib segments with the hand followed by application of large pieces of tape placed horizontally across the flailed segment. Place the patient in semi fowler's position or position the patient on the injured side if breathing is easier after cervical spinal injury has been ruled out. Prepare for emergency needle decompression if tension pneumothorax or cardiac tamponade are present. As care continues, we're going to need to monitor vital signs, level of consciousness, oxygen saturation, cardiac rhythm, respiratory status, and urinary output. We want to anticipate the need for intubation if our patient has significant respiratory distress. We also want to release the dressing if a tension pneumothorax develops after a sucking chest wound has been covered. Having gained some insight into some of the health issues that can arise from chest trauma, we now want to explore one of the major interventions for treating these conditions. Whenever fluid or air accumulates in the pleural space, the pressure becomes positive instead of negative and the lungs collapse. Chest tubes are inserted to drain the pleural space and re-establish negative pressure, allowing for proper lung expansion. They may also be inserted in the mediastinal space to drain air and fluid postoperatively. Chest tubes are approximately 20 inches or 51 centimeters long and vary in size from 12 French to 40 French. The size inserted is determined by the patient's condition. Large, which are 36 French to 40 French tubes, are used to drain blood. Medium, which are 24 French to 36 French tubes, are used to drain fluid. And small, 12 French to 24 French tubes, are used to drain air. Pigtail tubes are very small, 10 French to 14 French tubes, with a curly end designed to keep them in place. They are a safe and effective alternative to large bore chest tubes for treatment of pneumothorax. Insertion of a chest tube can take place in the emergency department, at the patient's bedside, or in the operating room. The patient is positioned with the arm raised above the head on the affected side to expose the mid-axillary area, the standard site for insertion. Elevate the patient's head 30 to 60 degrees when possible to lower the diaphragm and reduce the risk of injury. A chest x-ray is used to confirm the affected side. 
The area is cleansed with an antiseptic solution. The chest wall is prepared with a local anesthetic and a small incision is made over a rib. The area is first probed digitally to avoid injury with a sharp instrument. A clamp is used to hold the chest tube and guide it into place. The tube is advanced up and over the top of the rib to avoid the intercostal nerves and blood vessels that are behind the rib inferiorly. Once inserted, the tube is connected to a pleural drainage system. Two tubes may be connected to the same drainage unit with a Y connector. The incision is clothed with sutures and the chest tube is secured. The wound is covered with an occlusive dressing. Some clinicians prefer to seal the wound around the chest tube with petroleum gauze. The proper placement is confirmed by chest x-ray. The insertion of the chest tube and its presence in the pleural space is painful. Monitor the patient's comfort at frequent intervals and use appropriate pain relieving interventions. A flutter valve, also called the Heimlich valve after its inventor, is used to evacuate the air from the pleural space. This device consists of a one-way rubber valve with a rigid plastic tube. It's attached to the external end of the chest tube. The valve opens whenever the pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure, such as during expiration, and closes when the thoracic pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure, such as during inspiration. The flutter valve can be used for emergency transport and for small to moderate sized pneumothorax. It also allows for mobility of the patient, as the smaller drain bag can be hidden under the clothes while the patient ambulates. Drainage bags attached to the flutter valve must have a vent to the atmosphere in order to prevent a potential tension pneumothorax. This can be accomplished by simply cutting a small slit in the top of any drainage bag that doesn't have a built-in vent. Patients may go home with a Heimlich valve in place. The second type of chest drainage is larger and less portable and contains three basic components, each with a separate function. This figure depicts the original setup for the pleural drainage using glass bottles. Although the glass bottles have been replaced by a single plastic unit, visualization of the separate compartment makes it easier to comprehend. The first compartment or collection compartment receives the fluid or air from the pleural or mediastinal space. The drainage fluid stays in this chamber while the air vents to the second compartment. The second compartment, called the water seal chamber, contains two centimeters of water, which acts as a one-way valve. The incoming air enters from the collection chamber and bubbles up through the water. The water prevents backflow of air into the patient from the system. The third compartment, the suction control chamber, applies suction to the chest drainage system. There are two types of suction control, water and dry. The water suction control chamber uses a column of water with the top end vented to the atmosphere to control the amount of suction from the wall regulator. The chamber is typically filled with 20 centimeters of water. When the negative pressure generated by the suction source exceeds the 20 centimeters, air from the atmosphere enters the chamber through the vent on the top and the air bubbles up through the water causing a suction breaker effect. As a result, excess pressure is relieved. Initially, brisk bubbling of air occurs in this chamber when a pneumothorax is evacuated. Intermittent bubbling during exhalation, coughing or sneezing, when the patient's endothoracic pressure is increased, will continue as long as there is air in the pleural space. As the source of the air in the pleural space gets smaller, it will take more and more positive interpleural pressure to force air out. Eventually, the air leak will seal and the lung will be fully expanded. Normal fluctuation of water within the water seal chamber is called tidling. This up and down movement of water in concert with respiration reflects the interpleural pressure changes during inspiration and expiration. Investigate any sudden cessation of tidling. This may signify an occluded chest tube. Gradual reduction and eventual cessation of tidling is expected as the lung re-expands. The parietal and visceral pleural will form a tight seal around the chest tube openings, obliterating the response to changes in the interpleural pressure with respiration. As previously mentioned, the water suction control chamber uses a column of water with the top end vented to the atmosphere to control the amount of suction from the wall regulator, and that pressure is set at 20 centimeters of water. The amount of suction applied is regulated by the amount of water in this chamber and not by the amount of suction applied to the system. An increase in suction does not result in an increase in negative pressure to the system because any excess suction merely draws in air through the vent at the top of the third chamber. The suction pressure is usually ordered to be at negative 20 centimeters of water, although higher pressures, negative 40 centimeters of water, are sometimes necessary to evacuate the pleural space. Lower pressures, negative 10 centimeters of water, may be used with frail patients at risk for tissue damage with higher pressures. To initiate suction, the vacuum source is turned up until gentle bubbling is present in the chamber. Excessive bubbling does not increase the amount of applied suction, but does increase the rate of evaporation of the column of water and the amount of noise made by the device. This is a picture of the Atrium Pleural Drainage Unit Water Suction Control. We'll be looking at a setup like this in class.
The dry suction control chamber contains no water. It has a visual alert that indicates if the suction is working. It uses either a restrictive device or a regulator to dial in the desired suction. This is internal in the chest drainage system. To increase the suction pressures, turn the dial on the drainage system. Increasing the vacuum source will not increase the pressure. When decreasing the suction, depress the manual vent to reduce excessive vacuum to the lower prescribed level. The addition of wall suction or active suction to the chest drainage unit may actually promote the development of air leaks and thus prolong the number of days the chest tube needs to remain in place. Patients with just water seal or passive suction have a shorter duration of air leaks. Although the majority of clinicians continue to use active suction, the use of water seal alone is gaining popularity. This is a picture of the atrium pleural drainage unit with dry suction control. As nurses, we will be responsible for the preparation and the care of the chest drainage unit. If it's wet suction, the first thing we're going to do is add sterile water to the 2 centimeter mark in the water seal chamber and to the 20 centimeter mark or as ordered in the suction control chamber. If it's dry suction, we're going to add sterile water to the fill line of the air leak meter. We're going to attach suction tubing and increase the suction until the bellows-like float moves across the display window. Keep all tubing loosely coiled below the chest level. Tubing should drop straight from the bed or chair to the drainage unit. Do not let it be compressed. Keep all connections between the chest tube, drainage tubes, and the drainage collection type and tape at connections. Observe the air fluctuation, or the tidling, and bubbling in the water seal chamber. If no tidling is observed, rising with inspiration and falling with expiration in the spontaneously breathing patient, the drainage system is blocked, the lungs are re-expanded, or the system is attached to suction. If the chest tube is connected to suction, disconnect from all wall suction to check for tidling. Observe for air leak in water seal chambers. If bubbling increases, that may be an indication of an air leak in the drainage system or a leak from the patient. Suspect a system leak when the bubbling is continuous. If the air leak persists, we clamp the chest tube at the patient's chest. If the leak stops, then the air is coming from the patient. If the air leak persists, briefly and methodically move the clamps down the tubing away from the patient until the air leak stops. The leak will then be present between the two clamped points. If the air leak persists all the way to the drainage unit, replace the unit. Observe fluid levels in water seal chambers. High fluid levels in the water seal indicates residual negative pressure. The chest system may need to be vented by using the high negativity release valve available on the drainage system to release residual pressure from the system. Do not lower water seal column when the water suction is not operating or when the patient is on gravity drainage. Monitor the client's status. Assess vital signs, lung sounds, and pain. Assess for manifestations of reaccumulation of air and fluid in the chest or the absence of breath sounds. Watch for significant bleeding, which is 100 mils or more per hour. Chest drainage signs of infection, like drainage or erythema or fever or increased white blood counts or poor healing. Notify the physician of the management plan. Evaluate for subcutaneous emphysema at the chest tube site. Encourage the patient to breathe deeply periodically to facilitate lung expansion and encourage range of motion exercises to the shoulder on the affected side. Encourage use of incentive spirometry every hour while awake to prevent atelectasis or pneumonia. Milking or stripping chest tubes is no longer recommended as these practices can dangerously increase interpleural pressure and damage lung tissue. Position tubing so that drainage flows freely to negate the need for milking or stripping. If ordered by a physician to milk or strip a tube, do so gently. So what is milking? It's alternately folding or squeezing and then releasing the drainage tubing. Milk only if drainage and evidence of obstruction can be seen. Take 15 centimeter strips of the chest tube and squeeze and release starting close to the chest and repeatedly down the tube distally. Stripping. Stripping is squeeze drainage tube with thumb and forefinger and use gentle pulling motion towards the tube with the other hand. Then release the tube. Closely monitor the patient for complications associated with chest tube placement and drainage. If volumes from 1 to 1.5 liters of pleural fluid are removed rapidly, re-expansion pulmonary edema or a vasovagal response with symptomatic hypotension can occur. Subcutaneous emphysema can occur from air leaking into the tissue surrounding the chest tube insertion site. A crackling sensation will be felt when palpating the skin. A small amount of subcutaneous air is harmless and will be reabsorbed. However, severe subcutaneous emphysema can cause drastic swelling of the head, neck with potential airway compromise. 
Meticulous sterile technique during dressing changes can reduce the incident of infected sites. Change the dressings according to the unit protocol and the physician preference. Remove old dressings carefully to avoid removing unsecured chest tubes. Assess the site and culture site if infected. Cleanse the site according to protocol, maintaining asepsis. Redress with occlusive dressing, such as opside or gauze with occlusive tape. Some physicians may prefer the use of petroleum gauze dressing around the tube to prevent an air leak. Date the dressing and document the dressing chain. Never elevate the drainage system to the level of the patient's chest because it will cause the fluid to drain back into the lungs. Secure the unit to the drainage stand. Change the unit if the collection chamber is full. Do not try to empty it. Mark the time of measurement and the fluid level on the drainage unit according to the unit's standards. Report any change in the quantity or the characteristics of the drainage, such as its color, its consistency, to the physician and record the change. Notify the physician if there's more than 100 mils of drainage per hour. Check the position of the chest drainage container. If the drainage system is overturned and the water seal is disrupted, return it to the upright position and encourage the patient to take a few deep breaths, followed by forceful exhalations and cough maneuvers. Clamping of the chest tube during transport or when the tube is accidentally disconnected is no longer advocated. The danger of rapid accumulation of air in the pleural space causing a tension pneumothorax is far greater than the small amount of atmospheric air entering into the pleural space. If the chest tube becomes disconnected, immediately reestablish the water seal system and attach a new drainage system as soon as possible. In some hospitals, when the disconnection occurs, the chest tube is immersed in sterile water about 2 centimeters until the system can be reestablished. It is important to know the unit protocol, individual clinical situation, and the physician preference before resorting to prolonged chest tube clamping. Appearance of a new air leak warrants assessment of the drainage system to identify if the air leak is coming from the patient or the system. Although controversial, some clinicians clamp the chest tube for a few hours prior to removal. This is done to assess how the patient will tolerate the chest tube removal. Generally, this occurs four to six hours before the tube is removed and the patient's closely monitored for signs of respiratory distress. The chest tubes are removed when the lungs are re-expanded and the fluid drainage has ceased or is minimal. Generally, suction is discontinued and the chest drainage is on gravity drainage for 24 hours before the tube is removed. Give the patient pain medication about 30 to 60 minutes before removal. Gather dressing supplies and petroleum jelly dressing. Explain the procedure to the patient. The tube is removed by the physician or an advanced practice nurse in most settings. The suture is cut and a sterile airtight petroleum gauze dressing is prepared. With the patient holding his or her breath or bearing down, doing a Valsalva maneuver, the tube is removed. The site is immediately covered with the airtight dressing to prevent air from entering the pleural space. The pleura will seal off and the wound usually heals in several days. A chest x-ray is done to evaluate for pneumothorax and or a reaccumulation of fluid. Observe the wound for drainage and reinforce the dressing if necessary. Assess the patient for respiratory distress, which may signify a recurrence of the original problem.